G'day everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me along to give this presentation. Hopefully you can see me in the in the screen there, including my uh, Indonesian shirt behind or over my back. And uh, hopefully I'm hearing, or rather I'm seeing messages that the audio is scratchy. Hopefully my audio is okay at the moment. Um, look, I'm the, the manager of climate prediction services here at the Bureau of Meteorology. So when you see things about El Nino and La Nina and and uh, you know, what's happening over rainfall over the next few months and so forth. That's coming out of the office here. Um, so uh, hopefully, ooh, okay, some people are saying audio is fine. So that's good. Look, um, yeah, so that comes out of the office here. Uh, our job is mostly for Australia, of course. We focus upon Australia and the impacts, uh, the impacts upon, um, uh, upon Australia. But uh, we also do a lot of work for the World Meteorological Organization and helping out uh, Region 5, as they call it, so the South Pacific and nations in this part of the, part of the world. Um, there's a few messages there about can't, can't see, can't hear, so hopefully um, the general things are okay. Um, trying to bring the mic a little closer. Okay. Okay, so I'll start with the talk now. I'll get my face off the, off the screen. On the, the, we'll focus upon the talk itself. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to give a quite a number of slides, I guess, on El Nino. Uh, the, the talk, the topic was actually uh, its impact on Australian water resources. Look, I'm not a water guy, so I'll tend to focus more upon El Nino itself, and of course, what's going on at the moment in terms of what's impacting Australia. So hopefully, I'll forward to the first slide. So just an outline there. So we'll look at some of the current conditions. We'll look at the outlook and what's driving the outlook and then look at the uh, upcoming season and, and some of the uh, uh, some of the things that may happen in terms of events and so forth that impact upon water resources. And then have a quickie look at what may happen next. So in other words, what may happen in 2016. So in terms of the longer term context of, uh, of water and particularly rainfall and temperature that affect it, look, many people have um, have commented upon uh, the, the trends and how our rainfall and our temperatures are changing, of course. And these maps give a bit of an idea over the past decade. Now the map on the right are temperature deciles. And so deciles are basically splitting things up into, if you've got 100 years, splitting it up into 10 boxes, so 10 years each. And your, your, your warmest deciles are going to be up at decile 10, the top decile, and your coolest uh, decile 1, so the bottom 10%. So you can see from that map, lots of areas have actually had their warmest 10-year period on record for 2005 to 2014. And of course, um, of course that is, we've, we've indeed had our warmest decade on record for, for Australia as a whole. Now, in terms of rainfall, though, uh, many people have thought about the La Nina and the significant impacts we had during 2010 to 2012. But the reality is, over the cool season, the April to October period, uh, we have actually had uh, significant dry conditions right through eastern Australia, or rather right through southern Australia, with the, expect the exception being there up in the north. So in other words, things have generally been, for southern Australia, warmer and drier, and for northern Australia, wetter and a bit more towards average, but still warmer in some areas. In 2015, though, uh, looking at the rainfall deciles again, where the blue, blues are the wetter areas and the, the reds are the drier, in terms, of, uh, in terms of 2014 to 15, uh, October, through to last year to April, uh, we can see there in Eastern Australia, much of Eastern Australia is very dry, uh, or has been dry, um, and then to Central Australia, somewhat wetter, and indeed uh, over in the West has been wetter as well, leading into the start of the year. Um, but on the right there is the May to September of this year, uh, the maps for the map for that period, and you can see that for Victoria, uh, Northern Tasmania, Southwest WA, and indeed Queensland have generally been drier than normal. Um, the exception there being, for the east, being in New South Wales, where you can see that things have been, in fact, slightly wetter than normal, um, particularly there in the in the northwest, 
certainly if these are, have been the, the decile eight range or so, so very much above average there. But in general, uh, for most of the states there, it's been average to drive and average with the exception being of parts of New South Wales and also small parts of the coast, the east coast as well. I should actually use my pointer, I'll, I'll use a pointer, it might help me out a little bit uh, at times. Oh, maybe that's not going to work. Look, temperatures in 2015, um, for March to May, so during the autumn, were generally cooler than normal through large parts of Western Australia and South Australia into Victoria and Tassie. Now over winter, many people seem to think that it was exceptionally cold period, uh, and indeed it was cooler than average slightly in Melbourne, uh, in, in Hobart, and also like in some parts of, say, Sydney and so on. Um, but the reality was, in actual fact, it was very much warmer than average for Australia as a whole. Uh, it was our, our third warmest uh, winter on record. Uh, and so in actual fact there, um, generally, temperatures were warmer than what people thought they were in the southeast. So that had an impact upon water usage, of course. In terms of once you have warmer conditions and drier conditions as well, it can lead to significant rainfall deficiencies. Uh, this map here is, um, is, of course, on the left is the July uh, 2014, so middle of last year through to September, end of September this year. And you can see that areas such as Western Victoria and also far north Queensland, but southern South Australia and into the, uh, into the coastal regions of Western Australia all had serious to, to severe rainfall deficiencies in some patches they're actually lowest on record for a July to September period. But longer term of course western, western Queensland comes into the mix because in those areas they had a failed wet season in 2000 and 2011-12 uh, and then in 13-14 and 14-15 wet seasons didn't really have a recovery they really only saw average at best. So unfortunately, things have gone backwards there due to the loss or effectively the, the failure of three wet seasons in a row. Hopefully, they're not, not looking at a fourth, but uh, of course, we'll, we'll talk more about that a little later on. And in that longer term period as well, the, the, the longer term there, you can see October 2012 to September 2015, uh, that three-year period uh, indeed has also affected Western Victoria and southeast and South Australia. So those are two most significant areas for rainfall deficiencies or for drought at the moment through the Queensland and uh, Western Victoria, southeast and South Australia. Little patches there in Tasmania as well, as you can see. So on to El Nino, and first of all, you know, what is El Nino? I've put up there, uh, if you're quick with a pen and paper, you can write down the, uh, the YouTube link there, and it's a very good YouTube video starring one of our, our senior climatologists here, Agata Inielska. But, uh, on, the, um, but on, the, uh, uh, on the diagram there, sorry, I keep reading the messages in the box on the left, so uh, it's a little bit distracting, but we'll get there. Look, the, the diagram there shows really what the El Nino, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation is, which describes the cycle between La Nina and its opposite, which is El Nino. So normally, you have this neutral condition. You can see that there on the, on the diagram. Um, hopefully I can get a, a pointer or something where I can, I can show you. Not sure if you can see that. Oh, the pointer's not working. Look, um, generally, generally you have this circulation going over uh, the Pacific Ocean, the equatorial Pacific Ocean, where you have cool water off South America and you have warmer water up off PNG. And in fact, some of the warmest water in the world is off Papua New Guinea. That's sort of around the, the 31, 30 to 32 degree, actually, but 30, 31 degree Celsius uh, water up there. It's a bit like having a, a lukewarm bath. And the, so typically the air rises over that area and, and descends over South America and you get this circulation that drives with the trade winds and mounds up water in the Western Pacific. And that's really your, your normal situation and the normal sort of rainfall patterns, et cetera, over Australia. But when you have, uh, but when you have El Nino, what happens is that basically your trade winds back off and that warm water that was north of Papua, of Papua New Guinea 
uh, starts to move across towards the east and you get your warmer than normal water there off South America, you get the weaker trade winds and you get a breakdown of that circulation. And that circulation in the atmosphere is called the Walker circulation. But in simplest terms, I think you can just think of it as you have normal conditions and when the warm water moves east, so does the cloud and the rain. So just jumping between them, you can see there how when that warmer water, that red pattern there uh, moves across to the east, the pattern in the atmosphere breaks down or rather the, the clouds and the rainfall moves away with it. And so you end up drying out Eastern Australia. So that's, that, that's El Nino 101. How do we monitor it and, and how do we keep an eye on what's going on out there in the tropical Pacific and whether we have an El Nino or not? Well, basically we look at a, a number of different factors. Now, the first one we look at is the sea surface temperatures. So how much warmer are they than normal? Now, fortunately that little box there seems to be a little bit wrong, but basically where we have the warmest water there, um, we have a, we have a, basically where we have the warmest water there in the Eastern Pacific, you uh, monitor the Eastern and Central Pacific areas and you look for when temperatures start to warm up start to exceed around about 0.8 of a degree above normal. Now at the moment we actually we have quite significant anomalies there. Um, we actually have temperatures that are two degrees or even 2.2, 2.3 degrees in some areas above normal in the in that eastern equatorial Pacific region. So we're looking out for those temperatures and below the surface we're looking for temperatures increases in the east as well where um, during the, uh, well, during the current event, uh, we've seen temperatures up to seven degrees above normal in the Eastern Pacific, uh, which is quite significant. If you dip your hand into two buckets of water and one was seven degrees warmer than the other, I bet you, you could tell the difference. Well, indeed, with uh, the, the equatorial Pacific, you can tell the difference at the moment, seven degrees above normal in the, uh, in the east, and indeed a couple of degrees below normal uh, in the west. So quite a significant temperature difference between the east and west below the surface. Uh, during the big El Nino, the biggest El Ninos we've seen, like 97, 98, temperatures were up to 10 degrees or even slightly more uh, above normal in the eastern Pacific. So the surface and the subsurface are critical in establishing El Nino because that goes and changes the pressure patterns. Now this is the Southern Oscillation Index and that's really just a difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin. And basically when the, uh, when the um, pressure changes or when the pressure difference becomes uh, negative there, you have a negative SOI and you can see at the moment it's very low. I should say the colours on that graph, the blue colours, uh, roughly where you would expect, expect there to be uh, or the values of the SOI when there's La Nina and the pinky ready colour on the bottom is where you might expect the SOI to be if there's an El Nino. And so you can see that we've been pretty solidly in that El Nino territory since around about the middle of 2015. The current value is minus 21.7. You, you think that you're in El Nino territory when you're at around about minus seven or so. So okay, we're well below, well below uh, the threshold well exceeding the threshold you might want to say uh, for El Nino at the moment there in terms of surface pressure. Um, trade winds are the next one that's very important to look at. Typically trade winds blow from the southeast um, during normal period. Uh, when you have an El Nino the trade winds tend to weaken quite a bit and so your, your anomalies you might say become westerly. Now you can see here the trade winds are still blowing from the southeast to some degree, but some areas here, they're actually the trade winds are blowing those are westerly. So they've completely reversed in some areas at the moment, which is something you really only see when you have a strong El Nino event. So very important, the trade winds, because without getting too much into the, the physics of it, they effectively uh, cause changes in the ocean um, by what's called uh, Ekman divergence. So in other words, the ocean doesn't perfectly travel in the direction of the wind below the surface of the ocean, it actually starts to turn to the left in the atmosphere, sorry, left in the southern hemisphere and to the right in the northern hemisphere. And so you do go and get this movement away from the equator, which effectively sucks up cooler water from, from below in some areas 
or, or rather in La Laosa. In some areas, and, and well, actually, I should say, during El Nino, when it weakens off, it doesn't suck up the cool water, and hence you can sort of warm the surface even more. And finally, the other thing that, that is a big signal to us is the cloud patterns. Now, at the moment, we're seeing in the tropics there, um, that map on the bottom there, uh, the blue to purple areas are where there's more cloud, and the brown areas are where there's less cloud than normal. And so that picture that we're seeing there is, is a pretty classic sort of El Nino type signal in the cloud. We've got more cloud out there in the central to eastern Pacific, tropical Pacific, and far less cloud over, well, normally it'd be over Australia as well, but uh, over um, what we call the maritime continent. So PNG and uh, right through there, there's through Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Borneo, and so on. And at the moment, we have quite severe fires out there in parts of Indonesia, Borneo, which are adding to the gunk in the atmosphere and making life even more unpleasant uh, prior to the monsoon, when things are getting unpleasant enough with the heat and, and high humidity as well. So there's a few ways, just four ways that we monitor to check what's going on. At the moment, we have quite a classic uh, signature out there. It's pretty easy to be a climatologist and say there's an El Nino at the moment, but most of our lives are frustratingly pulling out our hair as we're trying to diagnose multiple, multiple patterns at the same time and working out what's happening and what may happen. And there's various ways we do that uh, to help ourselves other than those four. Now we have we use these various uh, diagnostic tools to come up with the status of ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, at the moment, we of course are in El Nino territory. It's clearly in El Nino territory. We actually our uh, ENSO tracker went into El Nino territory way back in May. It's also looking likely that we'll continue uh, with this El Nino through to the end of the year, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And that at the moment, it's probably right, we're arguing that it's rivaling the big events of 72, 73, 82, 83, and 97, 98. Still a bit of a, a El Nino water to go under the bridge yet. Um, or I should say El Nino water to flow across the equator yet. And, uh, and we are still short of the peaks of those events, but El Ninos typically don't peak until the end of the year, more so sort of December or even even January. So sometime between November and January the, we expect the event to peak. And I think I show something here on the next slide. So this is from our ENSO model summary that comes out on about the 16th of every month. So this should be coming out in a couple of days time on Friday. It will be updated. But the most recent one there show these three panels. And the leftmost one is for October 2015. There's eight models from around the world. So the, the Bureau, the Canadian model, the European model, the Japanese, the French, two from the US, NASA and NOAA. NOAA is like their weather bureau over there and the UK Met Office. And so we survey these models regularly every month. Actually, I should say they send us their data. So we're getting what they believe is, is going on at the moment. Um, we present them on our web page and then, of course, present the average as well. And you can see there that October is really forecast to be fairly strong, plus 2.4 out there, or 2.4 degrees on average is the model forecast for that equatorial Pacific region. So that's how many degrees above normal it's expecting it to be. We're currently at about 2.2, so I think this is pretty much uh, on the mark. Then December, uh, similar sorts of values. But by February, you're starting to see some of the models back off and back off fairly strongly. Other models are sticking with it a little more, but we would expect to start seeing things break down in a typical El Nino cycle around about that, that February period or, or even a little bit earlier. So we can see there a strong event and remembering that the cutoff, I should say the cutoff or threshold for El Nino is about 0.8. So when you're up at the, the two degrees above normal mark, uh, that's quite a lot above 0.8 of course, and you are truly in a strong event something that has only been seen a few times in the last few years. Anyway, strong event forecast to continue into early summer 2015, and then we start, we would expect it to start to decay uh, in late summer uh, of 2015-16 and autumn of 2016. So we'd expect things to start breaking down uh, in, the, in the new year if things go as the model suggests, but also if things obey what history has told us in the past or how history has behaved in the past. So what are some of the impacts? So temperature-wise, uh, southern Australia, and 
maximum temperatures are typically warmer than normal. Again, we're seeing deciles here, and so the, the, the brownie, browns to reds are a lot warmer than normal. We expect things to be a fair bit warmer than normal in winter, spring. Um, and then going into summer, a little bit of more of a mixed bag in summer, and partly that's because some of the events start to break down in summer. Some do, some don't. So remember, this is probably a, a bit of a best case scenario to some degree, but things do tend to stay warmer than normal uh, into the summer period. We do tend to get earlier um, temperatures above 30 degrees, say, for southern Australia. So you do tend to get a, an earlier start to summer, and we've indeed seen that in a number of the number of regions of late with the uh, October heat wave that set quite a few records for early temperatures, in other words, um, you know, earliest 30s and earliest 35s and so on. But in terms of uh, what we're interested in, or I, I should say actually after talking about that, look, um, I might have a slide out of, out of order here, sorry. So typically, um, in typical El Nino rainfall impacts. So we have here a similar sort of pattern for or maps for rainfall. So here's the spring rainfall pattern uh, on the left. And so you can see typically we're in sort of these decile three uh, to decile two um, areas of decile four. So you can see that there's many areas where the rainfall is, is below average, much of Eastern Australia, including Tassie, but up there into the, into the um, top end as well. But again, come December to February, so come summer, um, that pattern again is a little more unclear because some of summer can be the breakdown period where you start getting a little bit of rain. But in general, it's a bit drier across the north because the uh, monsoon tends to come a, a little bit later and a bit drier in the southeast as well. It just takes a little, uh, a little longer when things, when events break down to, to see its way into those areas. So I'll just skip back one, one slide here to what I was going to say. But of course, individual years vary. There's quite a big variation between El Nino events. Uh, 1982 was a, it was a strong event, 1982-83, strong El Nino. And, yet, and you can see there that there's many areas of red, in other words, lowest on record uh, during that event as a whole. But 1997 was considered to be even stronger in terms of El Nino. And it was quite patchy when you consider the event as a whole. It's dry in parts of the southeast and parts of Queensland, but lots of the map is white, in other words, closer to average. And indeed, we had great rain uh, in May and September, which are critical for uh, agriculture and, and other applications uh, as well, uh, even though the winter was relatively dry and so forth. At least a couple of wet months got us through much of the year. But of course, as the graphic there says in the middle, seven of Australia's 10 driest years on record occurred during El Nino. And, uh, and likewise, we've had 26 El Nino and 17 of, of them have brought widespread drought. So uh, yes, it doesn't guarantee dry conditions across eastern Australia and, and southern Australia, but it does and certainly raise the odds for dry conditions. Uh, and so it's always prudent for people to take uh, some risk management when they see uh, and hear the Bureau and others talking about El Nino. So what are some of the impacts just of El Nino more generally? So here, in terms of a water storage, is Eildon uh, here in Victoria, down here in Victoria. Um, if you look over all the years back to 1980, uh, the average uh, over all those years in terms of inflows is about 51% of inflow data. But when you look at um, El Nino events, it's down to about 33%. So in other words, or 33rd percentile. So in other words, you, you do certainly drop quite a lot uh, from uh, inflows of you know, just above median or around median, of course, for all, but uh, and then down quite a lot, down to the 33rd percentile when you actually have an El Nino event. So quite significant impacts can be felt in terms of inflows to storages. So at the moment, we have, certainly have a strong El Nino in the Pacific, as I've mentioned, but we also have a warm Indian, Indian Ocean. And so you can see here, um, you can see that over uh, um, the Pacific, we have the, the El Nino event, the classic warm tongue, as we call it. But over the Indian Ocean, things are very warm as well, those red colours over most of the Indian Ocean there. And the graph on the bottom there clearly shows how we've seen a, a trend in southern Indian Ocean temperatures, so the Indian Ocean south of the, south of the equator. Um, going back there to 1950. Um, 
but you can also see the three red bars being the uh, El Nino events of 82, 97, and now 2015. And so clearly what we're seeing at the moment is one of the warmest, or is the warmest, El Nino on record in terms of Indian Ocean temperatures. And that's having a moderating effect, or has had, I should say, during the winter, some moderating effect. Now, I think, unfortunately, this video is uh, not wanting to play for me. Uh, we'll, give it one last, we'll give it one last chance before we officially declare it's not going to work. I think we're going to declare it's not going to work. I'll go back to the slideshow. But I was hoping to show on this one how and compare 1997 to 2015. And we could indeed see that uh, the temperatures, even though they're comparable in the Pacific, they're actually quite different out there in the Indian Ocean with far warmer temperatures at the moment than in 1997. So here's another video I was going to show. We'll see how we go with this one. Hopefully people can can see see this see this one. Get to come up. Yeah. So what you hopefully you can see there on the video is that uh, we've got the the warm conditions out in the out in the Indian Ocean, and indeed, let's just play that again. Yeah. So we've got the warm conditions out in the Indian Ocean, and you can see moisture streaming in across the continent sometimes even forming clouds out in the Indian Ocean there where it's uh, very warm. And you can see it streaming the moisture in across the continent. This is from some of our new Himawari satellite imagery, which comes in, uh, comes in every few minutes. So um, this was actually recorded over several days. So this cloud band actually existed for several days, bringing in moisture right into New South Wales. Now, if I go back to the slideshow there, um, the other thing that's happening, and this is a little more complex, but the, the, the map uh, on the left is basically showing, and you should be able to see Australia in the right corner, the, the, the sea surface temperature anomalies, so warm in the Indian Ocean, but actually average to cooler than average around Antarctica. And that's created quite a strong temperature gradient. Now, there's physical reasons, um, uh, a thing called the thermal wind equation, but basically when you get a gradient like that, it affects how uh, the winds turn with height and how strong those winds are with height. Now you've got a strong gradient west of Australia and a weak gradient directly south of Australia. So we end up with a pattern in terms of things higher up in the atmosphere at what we call the 500 hectopascal height, which is uh, roughly five kilometers or so up. Um, we actually get a pattern which is directing or rather directing things up towards southeastern Australia. And what we often refer to this height as sort of the steering flow, what steers, uh, steers the weather patterns um, at the surface and so on. So that's been directing stuff from the south up, up into southeastern Australia. And if you go back to our video, again, not only can you see, um, so not only can you see the clouds streaming across from central of Australia, but you can also see clouds pushing up into southeastern Australia as well, coming well up from the south. And that was fairly typical of what happened this year uh, in terms of where the guiding flow, the higher levels of the atmosphere were, were pushing the cloud patterns and so on. So you're getting more moisture and you're also getting stuff brought up from the south uh, to kick things along in terms of rainfall. But the other uh, factor that's starting to really rear its head now is the Indian Ocean Dipole. Now, effectively, it's a bit like an El Nino out in the, uh, or rather, Indian Ocean dipole. It's a bit like Enso out in the out in the Indian Ocean. Now, on the left there, we have the negative phase, and normal conditions are a bit like a weak negative phase. You've got warm water, um, you've got warm water uh, off uh, Australia or northwest of Australia. Uh, some of the warmer water is there, and cooler water off Africa. And basically, it sets up this pattern where you get the rainfall over Southeast Asia and Northern Australia and so on, and less rainfall off Somalia and those sorts of dry areas that we know from, from Africa. But when you have a positive phase, so a positive Indian Ocean dipole, in fact, the opposite happens. So you get cooler water to the northwest of Australia. You get warmer water off Africa. And a bit like I said with El Nino, where the the cloud and the rain follow the warm water. The same thing happens in the Indian Ocean. So when it becomes warmer off Africa, they actually get increased convection, increased, increased cloud cover, and increased
increased rainfall. So mufflers might be dry, bring dry conditions to us. It actually can be something that they uh, quite look forward to over there in Africa, and, and of course, sometimes uh, humanitarian reasons, it's uh, arguably more important over there. Unfortunately, of course, the cool water combined with is positive for Indian Ocean dipole pattern. The cool water combined with uh, with El Nino means that you actually get quite a significant drying through areas such as Papua New Guinea, and you can have humanitarian issues in those areas. And we know in 97, 98, well over 20,000 people perished in New Guinea alone, we believe, uh, possibly more, uh, because of the dry in those areas. So it does create difficult times when you combine an in a positive Indian Ocean dipole with El Nino. So here's another way of looking at this is what's happening at the moment for the week, uh, well, basically the start of this week. You can see there's cool water around Papua New Guinea and so on. Now, these two grey boxes are effectively the two areas that are used to define the Indian Ocean dipole. And basically, we subtract the, the eastern box from the, from the western box to come up with the value of the Indian Ocean dipole. And as you can see there, at the moment, it's currently warm box to come up with the value of the Indian Ocean dipole. And as you can see there, at the moment, it's currently warmer off Africa, warmer than normal off Africa, and cooler than normal off Sumatra. And so uh, we actually have a positive Indian Ocean dipole. But we're also seeing that, wa that cool water, sorry, around Papua New Guinea and to the north of Australia. And in some ways, that uh, even further enhances the effect of an El Nino, of a positive Indian Ocean dipole as well. So both of them reinforcing each other that have a drying influence and the cool waters to North Australia can uh, also uh, increase the effect of uh, El Nino. You still clearly see the warm waters of Australia in the Indian Ocean as well, but it's that cooling around uh, Indonesia, PNG, Borneo, and so on that we're watching, as well as this positive Indian Ocean dipole pole pattern. So I guess what I'm saying at the moment is we've got El Nino, we've got positive Indian Ocean dipole, and we've got cool waters to the North of Australia are all, uh, all tick the box for a, a drier, um, at least middle part of spring to later spring as well. And they're, but they're fighting off the, the uh, warmer waters more to the south, which might be uh, trying to push systems up into Australia that have a bit more moisture. So you've sort of got three dries and, and one wet influence at the moment, and, and the dries, of course, have now taken over to some degree our patterns, our weather patterns. So during an Indian Ocean dipole event, or I should say a positive Indian Ocean dipole event, just like I said then, typically during winter spring, we have the pattern on the, on the left with dry conditions through uh, central Australia and into the southeast, uh, central and southern Australia and in the southeast there as well. Typically these events peak during uh, or start during May to June, peak during, well, sort of spring or getting into spring, but then they decay come November. And so even if we have a you know, dry October, at least one of these drying influences should start to back off come November or sometime in November. What happens is the, uh, the monsoon uh, northwest of Australia starts to kick in. It reverses the winds, and hence you uh, actually can't really sustain the cooler water south of Sumatra with the change in wind patterns. The winds become more westerly. and, uh, and it's the basically the, uh, the, the dynamical reasons you can't maintain the, the cooler water there south of Sumatra. Now the map on the right there is the winter spring rainfall deciles, so lots of brown colours down in those low deciles um, of a positive IOD events when they're combined with the El Nino years. And you can see you get even more red on those maps for, for winter and spring rainfall. Typically a uh, little effect during the summer though, because like I say, the Indian Ocean Dipole, the positive Indian Ocean Dipole can't be maintained because of the change in the winds due to the monsoon up there off uh, Indonesia. So uh, for some good signs, you know, some better signs, I guess, for later, later in the year. Um, because of this, because of the Indian Ocean Dipole, we changed our outlooks a couple of, or a week or so ago from what we originally issued for the October to December period. So we've really seen that Indian Ocean Dipole, that positive Indian Ocean Dipole kick in really hard just over the last few weeks. Our original outlooks looked like this for temperature. Maximum temperatures there on the left uh, were looking, well, warmish in southern Australia and likewise a bit warm for minimum temperatures 
But when we, um, oops, I guess click on that. But when that Indian Ocean dipole pattern really started to take off and we started to get the cooling north of Australia and the cooling or significant cooling south of Sumatra, we had to change our outlooks. So if the, the facts change, we change, we change with it. And, uh, and so things are, are now looking a lot warmer for southern Australia uh, because of those patterns, because of the, the lessening of the importance of the warmer Indian Ocean due to the other factors. Similarly, our rainfall outlook for October to December, and likewise on the right there for just October and November, looking, well, average to, to dry than average for parts of eastern Australia, uh, but wetter inland and into the southwest. But once that positive Indian Ocean dipole and the cooler waters to the north of Australia really started to take hold uh, late in the month, um, we updated our outlook. Now, these are dynamical model outlooks. These are outlooks from our POEMA dynamical model. In other words, a physics-based model, not, uh, not statistical. These basically suck in around 40, these models suck in about 40 million observations or pieces of information from satellites and floating buoys and all those sorts of things. And then they run phys the equations of the atmosphere and the ocean and the ice and so on and come up with new outlooks. They generate real weather, I should say, so they're, they're not just a statistical relationship, they actually, actually generate weather and we can see, even see things like typical cyclones and so forth. Anyway, using that model, um, plugging in the new data, uh, particularly that ocean data, um, for the Indian Ocean and north of Australia, and it came up with a very much drier than normal map year. So odds in excess of 80% uh, for large parts of eastern Australia, particularly New South Wales and Victoria, and unfortunately for those drought areas uh, west of Queensland, so the odds went up, so we reissued our, our outlook a week or so ago. You can see how it affected October, significantly drier looking in October, but also uh, they're significantly drier in the southeast of Australia uh, for the rest of the year. So some of, the, some of the impacts of El Nino and these patterns that we might expect to typically occur. Um, so for the North Australian monsoon, um, we would expect that to typically come a bit later. So rather than, uh, say, at Darwin coming coming late in the, whoops, my phone go off. So rather than rather than um, rather than coming uh, in late December, uh, unfortunately coming in the first half of first half of January, of course that drives people a little crazy with the, the very hot and, and humid weather and so on in the in the build up. Um, in terms of bushfire potential, which is important for many catchments and so forth uh, with these dry conditions, and there may well be an update to this uh, come November, but the bushfire CRC and AFAC uh, together with the Bureau put out the, the map you can see on the, on the left. Um, sorry. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, Unfortunately, uh, sorry, getting my phone going off. Um, unfortunately, yeah, you can see that many areas have above normal bushfire potential uh, through eastern Australia um, and into western Australia and southwest as well. Um, and so uh, the AFAC have been warning people to um, take their precautions early and get ready for what potentially could be a difficult bushfire summer. And the diagram on the right just points out that Actually, whereas most people think El Nino might be what causes a lot of our bad fire potential, um, in actual fact, when we're in a positive Indian Ocean dipole pattern, that actually uh, tends to be more associated with, uh, um, unfortunately, bad, uh, bad fire years. Tropical cyclones. Um, we issued our tropical cyclone outlook a couple of a couple of days ago. Um, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and we were basically saying that during an El Nino event, you get fewer landfalling uh, tropical cyclones. Um, but uh, particularly along the, of Queensland, off the east coast there, uh, but in northwest Australia and western Australia, you tend to uh, have a, um, a, some change, but not a significant change uh, as what you get in, in other areas. Um, Offshore tropical cyclones can create strong winds and violent surf, so it's always important that even to know that even if a cyclone doesn't cross the coast, uh, of course, we actually can get some significant changes or significant damage to areas along our coast. And likewise, with uh, 
former or ex-tropical cyclones, they tend to um, they tend to also do a lot of rain damage as well. And so, um, and, and one other thing, of course, is of course uh, those farmers out in Western Queensland would actually like there to be some tropical cyclones, and hence, um, and hence uh, they would like to get those tropical depressions coming inland and providing the rainfall. Uh, but um, uh, it's looking less likely this year. And if we go forward to the to the rainfall, the official rainfall outlook, you can see that. The chances of an above average season, so in other words, the odds of getting more than the long term average number of cyclones for the various areas, and you can see you can see the list there, um, is very low. So in other words, a high chance of having below normal numbers of tropical cyclones uh, for the coming season, which generally goes November through to April. Severe thunderstorms and where we um, gauge them or, or rather define them as having um, you know, large hail and, and uh, wind gusts, strong wind gusts, uh, can produce tornadoes and so on. Um, is one of the risks uh, through parts of large parts of Australia during the severe weather season. But of course, they can bring uh, rainfall and flash flooding uh, to these areas as well. But the, the map on the on the bottom right there is the average number of severe thunderstorms at the various capital cities. So the, the peak there in southeast Queensland around Brisbane with 30 every uh, every wet season, and then uh, fewer down there, or the fewest in uh, in Perth and also in uh, in Tasmania down there in Tasmania. Now, typically um, during an El Nino period, things change a little bit. The two graphs, the maps there, um, are basically showing El Nino versus La Nina. It might be a little difficult to instantly look at it and gauge what's going on. But effectively, those stippled areas during El Nino, so there in Western Australia, are slightly more favourable, uh, slightly more favourable for thunderstorms. And that little squiggly line along the along the divide uh, in New South Wales there, uh, slightly less favourable for for thunderstorms during the summer. Central Australia also tends to be a bit too dry for for thunderstorm activity during uh, during El Nino events. So. Um, the other problem can be for some areas and some catchments, uh, indeed, of course, is dry lightning strikes. And the odds of that go up a little bit during El Nino, which is not a good thing, of course, combined with drier and, uh, and warmer conditions that may have uh, dried out the landscape a little more. So um, for some areas, some areas uh, more, so in WA, but uh, potentially on the divide, uh, a slight chance of, of fewer uh, severe thunderstorms in those areas. Heat waves, and I won't focus on them too much because it's more about um, human health and so on, but uh, we tend for southern Australia, heat wave risk goes up, um, and where a heat wave is three days or more of both maximum and minimum temperatures being uh, well above normal. And indeed, if you average your maximum and minimum temperature for a day and it goes above 30, so in other words, if, you, if your daytime temperature was, was uh, 40 degrees and the overnight low was 20, but the average overall is 30. Once it gets above 30, that's when we see um, quite significant, uh, uh, significant health risks uh, for the population, unfortunately. Uh, our heatwave service will be uh, launched in November uh, once again. Flood risk, of course. Um, the map on the left is our current stream flow outlook for the October to December period. Um, and so we're looking at, at 98 locations that we monitor out of the 120 or so uh, locations, um, 98 of our locations are likely to have low flows for the October to December period, with a further 13 having near medium, medium flows. And looking at the soil moisture, which of course is one of the, the drivers of stream flow into the future, the current soil moisture of course is quite dry through Queensland and, and Victoria, Tasmania, and in southwest WA as well, a bit less so in New South Wales. And that's primarily where we're getting a number of these near median flows at the very least. So, um, of course, major widespread flooding is less during El Nino events than La Nina, but it is the wet season. We are heading into the wet season for northern Australia. We do get the odd tropical cyclone come ashore, fewer than normal, but uh, still they never had a season without one coming ashore from Australia. And so there's always going to be some localised flooding, uh, particularly in northern Australia uh, during any wet season, uh, but during El Nino, uh, 
remember that those widespread floods such as we saw in 2010, 12, uh, um, get the, uh, are fairly reduced. So um, we, we sometimes do see some flooding during the breakdown of El Nino, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So a bit of an impact summary there. Um, bushfire tends to be more likely because of danger to some catchments, of course. Heat wave and hence water use uh, is more likely during, uh, during the coming summer or the next few months. Tropical cyclone landfall is less likely for Queensland, but uh, similar than normal uh, in Northern Territory and WA. Widespread flooding, a bit less likely. Storms, a bit more likely through parts of WA, and, uh, but uh, uh, possibly reduced uh, on parts of the Great Dividing Range. And drought, of course, becomes more likely during uh, an extension of the drought, becomes more likely with the current setup we, uh, that we have looking for the months ahead. And speaking of months ahead, this is a uh, just a very quick slide I threw together today. But people say, well, what happens after El Nino? Well, about 40% of the time, El Nino events flip over into La Nina. So it's not even half the time, but at least it's a, a reasonable percentage, four, four times out of 10. Um, for some of the bigger events, though, we've sometimes seen them end with a bit of a end with a bit of a bang. So uh, these are some of the big events of the past, the 1905-06 El Nino, the 46-47 El Nino, 72-73, 82-83, 97-98. So the plots I've shown there are actually the rainfall for the three-month period, February to April of the, of the year where the El Nino started to break down. And you can see that for some of these bigger events, we do actually get some reasonable rainfall moving into not guaranteed, and certainly it's too early to call for for this year, or rather for 2016. Um, we really need the, the one of the problems with the modelling, of course, is we have a predictability barrier during the autumn, so we have to be a little cautious about long-range forecasts for the autumn. But still, we're just pointing out here that uh, some of the bigger events have broken down quite quickly and brought in rain. Uh, about four out of, four times out of ten, we actually expect El Nino to flip over into a La Nina. Most of the rest of the time you go into neutral conditions, it is reasonably rare to go into another El Nino event. So I think I'll leave it leave it there. I've um, spoken for long enough now. I hope I've given you at least a bit of an idea of our thinking here at the Bureau in terms of where we're currently at and also, of course, uh, where we may be over the coming months. And the, some of the, the severe weather risks, uh, but also most of those uh, will have some impact upon rainfall over much, much of Australia. Um, I'm happy to leave it there. Do I hand back to you, uh, Jerome or Rebecca? Thank you so much, Andrew. Very informative. I'm, I'm sure that everybody got a lot out of that. Uh, first of all, I just want to um, apologise for the technical difficulties that everyone uh, may have had. My microphone is scratchy, so that's that's on my end. Um, if anyone has any questions while we still have Andrew here, please go ahead and type them in the chat box down the bottom uh, and Andrew will uh, oh, answer yeah. them the best way he can. Thank you. So the question there from, from Vivian, Andrew, does the Bureau measure soil moisture? Uh, look, I think there's some, some basic measurements of soil moisture is, ma is made, and we use models to indeed, um, um, to indeed come up with the soil moisture maps. I think I showed one on one of the earlier slides there. Uh, we've got a few diff couple of different models we're working with at the moment, uh, but indeed we um, We'll be presenting some of that information, I believe, on our website 
pretty soon. We're working at putting that out to the to the public. So um, yeah, we do uh, indeed produce products, soil moisture products, and hopefully we'll be making them external uh, very soon. Uh, in terms of the, the slides being um, the slides being made available, um, I've got no problem with the slides being made available to people if uh, if that's the normal thing that's done. I'm quite uh, quite happy for that. So um, uh, I could pass my slides is one way or another across to uh, Jerome and Rebecca, and then they can look after things uh, from that end. So impact. <laughs> On the million dollar barrow hunt, I, I'm not quite sure about that one. Look, look typically during El Nino years, um, there's a bit less of flow through from the channel country and so on out into, um, out into the Gulf of Carpentaria, for instance. I'm not quite sure what that does for, for the, the barrow, but um, I guess you're going to have a bit less of fresh water flow through there. I'm not quite sure that that's good for the, that's good for the breeding at, at least. So, um, I'd have to leave that up to the fishermen to work out uh, how good that is for barra fishing in the, in the Northern Territory. Uh, maybe Martin, you can uh, you can let us all know when you uh, come back. Ah, so does our seasonal stream flow forecast use this information? So the seasonal stream flow forecast does indeed use a, a it's a statistical forecast at the moment. It does indeed use uh, much of the information about the, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean as well, and so, but it also uses antecedent conditions and and uh, various other factors. So yeah, it does take into account climate patterns more generally. We're yeah, hoping to move that seasonal streamflow forecast across uh, into a more into using the dynamical model into using Poema more and more, and uh, and indeed um, that will become available. Uh, or rather that POEMA, that dynamical model, will become uh, available, or become more part of our seasonal stream flow forecast as time goes on. Uh, so there's a question there about the heat wave prediction stuff being made publicly available. I believe November the 2nd will probably be the date that the heat wave prediction service is, is put out. Um, the heat wave we had already for many areas during October, interestingly enough, uh, wouldn't necessarily have uh, shown up on a heat wave warning service. And like I said earlier, um, a heat wave is really defined by not just heat during the day, but heat during the night as well, because if you don't get that relief overnight, that's when we see serious health impacts for, for people and for animals and so on as well. Uh, and indeed, um, the heat wave we had fairly recently, uh, had fairly recently, uh, because of the time of year, actually had reasonably cool, reasonably cool nights, so uh, wouldn't have actually really been considered a true heat wave in terms of how we've mapped it in the past. So there's a question there about climate change modelling, predicting a change to frequency of El Nino events in the future. That is a bit of a $64 million question. It's a very difficult one. In some ways, the ocean becomes warmer and becomes more El Nino-like. Uh, but in some ways, the atmosphere becomes more moist and becomes a little more La Nina-like. So there's a bit of a, a, a balancing act or a bit of a, a, a battle going on there at the moment. In terms, though, of frequency of strong El Ninos, it's thought that it's likely we'll see, or there's some current work that's suggesting uh, some future El Ninos may actually pretend to be stronger El Ninos. And uh, it was still, you know, it's still very much in its infancy, that work. It, it's the... That was the latest published research, anyway. So, how often, how often on average, do we have an El Nino and an IOD separately and together? Um, so, there's a question there also about does IOD cancel out the effects of El Nino? Look, IOD, Indian Ocean dipole pattern, and El Nino, or rather ENSO, I should say, both the El Nino and La Nina, you tend to get more positive Indian Ocean dipole patterns. So uh, come along when you have El Nino, and likewise you tend to get more negative Indian Ocean dipole patterns when you have La Nina. And many researchers think there's quite a strong, or clearly a strong link between the two, and I guess I'm firmly in that camp as well. You definitely up the odds of a positive IOD when you have El Nino, and you up the odds of a negative IOD when you have a La Nina. Um, and so, yes, for them to occur out of that phase is a little bit unusual. Um, but not every El Nino has a positive IOD, if that's what you're asking. It doesn't always happen. 
but definitely uh, or a number of the stronger ones and particular ones that have had stronger impacts upon Australia have been that combination. So I guess that's not the key point there. The, the stronger events in terms of impacting Australia, so let's say 2006 7 a relatively weak El Nino, but we actually had a, a reasonably strong positive Indian Ocean dipole and we did see quite severe impacts upon Australia. So um, one often comes with the other, but not always, but when they do come together, it does have actually, uh, it, it, they tend to enhance each other. Very rarely do they cancel each other out. It has happened, but it's, it's quite rare. Um, does El Nino or La Nina change the evaporation Rates, look, I'm, this is not an area that I'm a, a real expert in, but the tendency, some of the research suggests that, uh, yeah, that's true. You tend to have greater evapotranspiration during uh, during El Nino events than you do during La Nina events. Um, and of course, you have greater water stress in general during El Nino. Uh, and partly that's because of the heat. Um, partly you get some greater winds near coastal regions as well, a bit of more of a temperature difference between the ocean and, uh, and the land, uh, and of course the, the general drying trend as well. The air tends to be less humid, um, and so you, you tend to be more evaporation during El Nino events. One of the signatures of El Nino is actually that quite dry air or drier air than normal, and higher pressure as well. So someone's asking about Melbourne. Um, look, Melbourne clearly has, uh, in, uh, clearly has a relationship with El Nino, uh, so in other words, out in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this, but I guess one of the main ones is a strengthening of the subtropical ridge and an expansion of the subtropical ridge. Now that's the ridge or the belt of high pressure that sits over, over the continent. That tends to become, well one, it becomes higher pressures and two, it tends to be larger and a bit further south during El Nino and unfortunately then goes and uh, centres itself more so over our over Melbourne, uh, the Melbourne neck of the woods, and hence um, and hence drier conditions. Uh, the Southern Indian Ocean, uh, less so. Um, certainly, the the Indian Ocean has an impact upon Southeast Australia, but that's more related to the tropical Indian Ocean than the Southern Indian Ocean. So, yep, El Nino definitely affects Melbourne, uh, but so does the tropical Indian Ocean, and to a lesser degree, the, the Southern Indian Ocean. Okay, I think that's everybody. Um, look, if you haven't been able to ask a question that um, that you've been thinking of or there is something that you think of later, um, please feel free to send those questions through to either uh, Jerome or myself um, and we can we can forward them on to Andrew and see whether he can shed some light on, on something for you. Um, I think that's it for today. Thank you everybody for taking part in today's webinar. Thank you very much and for me. And have a lovely pleasure. afternoon. Thank you.